for us. And uh, so you can get everybody excited. It certainly gets me excited. Oregon is an amazing place. During the summer, there are any number of adventures to be had. It's a time to explore, a time to expand horizons, and a time to grow. And as much as we love the summer, summer, there are many of us who feel as if we're waiting for something. Then one morning, you wake up with the first chill of fall in the air, and you know the time is drawing near. The first snowfall. The longer nights. When you start to dream. Of coming home. Everybody's standing up and cheering. Yay, that's a great video, great way to get us uh, started. Welcome all of our uh, Sahali Pass holders for our virtual meeting. Um, this is gonna be a great opportunity to talk to you about uh, what we've got planned for this season and uh, uh, show off a little bit about what we've been working on for over the last two years with a lot of the near finishing touches that we have on this beautiful building right now. This picture that you're looking at right now was shot on Sunday. So it's actually there. It's actually framed in. We're, we're gonna give you a, a really good um, uh, tour of the building so you can see what's inside of it as well. Uh, want to introduce our panelists here, our team that's going to be talking about Sahala in the upcoming season. You have your executive team, Matthew Drake, who's our chairman and CEO, Greg Pack, our general manager, Mel Tony, our vice president of mountain operations, Jeremy Riss, our vice president of resort operations. I'm gonna skip down to myself, Dave Trigathon, vice president of sales and marketing. We also have Lisa Cordy, our guest services manager, and Katie Cadlam, our director of business development. And now I'm going to introduce to you Matt Trotsky. He's our VP of People and Learning. He's our moderator, and he can uh, 
uh, first tell you a little bit about himself and a memorable mountain or winter or outdoor recreation experience so that you can under, so you get to know him a little bit. Matt? All right, thanks, Dave, and hi, everybody. Well, uh, my function here at Mountain of Meadows is uh, just about the same as everybody else. It's to uh, rock the guest experience. Uh, we all endeavor to make sure that we're enriching the lives for, for everyone that comes into contact with us. My specific role here is uh, that I oversee all of the human resources functions. And in addition to that, uh, I also try to guide the strategies uh, that our leadership, our managers and supervisors all use to make sure that we can have a successful workplace. Uh, as far as my memorable uh, experience that they've asked us all to share, uh, I come to uh, the, the skiing world through the outdoor recreation and outdoor educator uh, world. And so my passion is really for uh, outdoor recreation in general and uh, also for healthy workplaces. Um, one of my most memorable experiences uh, is uh, during finals one year or after finals, we uh, all did a, a bunch of friends of mine and I did a winter trip into the Boundary Waters uh, and all the lakes were frozen in December and we'd go winter camp. And that was often a tradition for us to celebrate finals before we all returned home for the holidays. And uh, one of the most memorable trips I took there was uh, met with the, the about the day before we were going to leave. Uh, it started snowing and we ended up with about a six foot dump and uh, the temperatures plummeted to about 40 below. And at, at, that, at those temperatures, even our polar wax didn't uh, really work on it to get us any grip on our skis. So we ended up uh, pulling our pulling our sleds out of the boundary waters in six feet of snow to be met with. Uh, what was uh, the, the guy who jumped out of his plow truck informed us that he was the last plow truck uh, to come through our parking lot and uh, they were pulling all those folks off the road as well. So uh, we were able to uh, make it home to our families. And I think about that experience as, uh, uh, as it relates to us here, because we've certainly, certainly in uh, very tough times. And uh, I, most of our management team has worked very diligently this summer uh, to be as prepared as we can uh, to withstand any any storm uh, real or metaphoric and so uh, with that I wanted to share just a couple of housekeeping items Dave alluded to uh, the question and answer box uh, if you're if you're unfamiliar with zoom uh, there's a, a you can open up your question and answer box in your toolbar there's also a chat window you can use either one of those to send us questions the question and answer box allows us and anyone on the panel to answer that question and all participants will be able to see those answers. Uh, so that's a great way to be able to ask a question, allow us to answer it, uh, and then know that you know, if other people have that question, they're going to be able to see that. The chat function uh, works similar. Sometimes the chat gets going uh, a little too fast for us to keep up. So uh, one of my roles tonight is to sit in the back and just make sure that we are keeping up with your chat. So however you wanna get us your questions, uh, that's fine with us. We will do our utmost to make sure we answer all of them. Uh, the other thing that you will see uh, is we have a couple polls. And so uh, I'll, I'll be revisiting you here in a few minutes uh, to launch a couple polls. You'll see that pop up in your window and you'll be able to participate in our polls so that we can get a little bit of information from you that may uh, guide some of our uh, instruction as we, as we go forward. So with that, uh, I would like to introduce our Director of Finance, uh, Doug Holmes. Thanks, Matt. As Matt mentioned, I'm Doug Holmes, Director of Finance. I've been with Meadows for almost two years now. And for those of you that haven't picked up on it, I have a little bit of an East Coast accent. So occasionally I might drop an R, add an A. So please um, bear with me on that one. Or put it in the chat if you need clarification. My uh, memorable experience growing up on the East Coast and skiing I was actually, my daughter started skiing with us at four years old, and she ended up working at the mountain that I worked at back east. She was in marketing, I was in finance, and she actually started a race one year on the local races that we had done. And it was a really great experience to have her grow to a skier where, you know, instead of waiting for her all the time, I actually had to worry about her catching and passing me. So um, it was just one of those things. Skiing to me is, you know, a family event, sharing it and just enjoying the outdoors. 
that's what I wanted to share today. So thank you all for attending. All right, Doug. Um, one of the things that uh, uh, you know we share uh, here at Mount Hood Meadows and, and we share with our Sahali Pass holders is how much we love uh, the mountain. And you know, it, it, it's this mountain, it may be Mount Hood, it may be that, that mountain that you grew up at, it may be the very first mountain that you ever went to, but that's, that's one of the reasons why we all like to return. And uh, that's why we came up with the name Your Mountain Home. Because you know, even though we don't have overnight lodging and we don't have people that are necessarily sleeping at the resort, it always feels like home when we when we come back to it. And I'm so excited to uh, uh, to present to you and to talk to you about um, the Sahali uh, building. And uh, you should be able to see my full screen again. I'm hoping. Um, we we'll go over the agenda here. Uh, you've had the welcome and the introductions, and uh, you'll get a chance to hear from others, including myself, about our mountain experiences as, as we move along. But we wanted to give you a progress update on the Sahali building, uh, and Jeremy and Greg and Matthew will be doing that. And then we're going to talk about our coronavirus operational plan for the season, and Mel's going to bring us up to date on, on that. And then some of the specifics about the Sahali Pass, uh, the carryovers that we had from last year, uh, reassigning and some of the things that we're trying to plan for this year, although that's gonna be you know, a little bit difficult the way things change and, and the, the uh, uh, current situation as it is, we're gonna do our best though. And then we have a Q and A and that's when we throw it to uh, everybody in the room and you ask questions and We'll have a, a good dialogue and, and talk about the season to come. So um, first, before we start uh, showing you live what's in Sahali, that would give you a, a little bit of a feel for, um, for the building. And um, I guess first we should, we should probably do a, a poll. Uh, how are you feeling about the season? Matt, you want to launch that? Sure, Dave. I just put that out there. You'll see, oops, sorry, my bad, wrong poll. <laughs> I got, go. my, got my order wrong. There we go. There's the one. Uh, we just, we do this with our team. Uh, we do town halls every, every couple of weeks to keep our team abreast of how things are going. And uh, we, we wanted to find out from you folks as well, how you feel about the upcoming season. Uh, we know that there's plenty of reasons to be uh, any one of these things. So I'll just give you a few seconds to fill the poll in. I'll uh, let turn it back over to Dave and I'll just stop polling here in another 20 seconds or so and then share the results. Yeah, and we know we already have some questions coming in. And from what I see in the questions, I think all of them uh, are gonna be addressed here uh, in our presentation. So uh, you, you can keep sending in the questions and some of them will uh, just type an answer to you and others will just address as part of the presentation. And we also have chat going. We'll try to keep uh, an eye on the chat as well. So uh, I think we got most of our poll results in. I'm gonna uh, end that. And is it sharing? There it is. Well, we are excited to, to hear from you that you're stoked about the season. I'm sure that having a storm come in and you know when we planned any type of a Sahali event that we do, we'll usually have a lot of weather associated with it. We found out. <laughs> haven't we? So uh, we're stoked as well. Uh, it's great to, to, to have snow coming in on November 10th. Um, you, you know, there are some people who are terrified. You know, there are some that are anxious. Um, and I think what we saw with our team since we started planning for uh, this season, uh, going all the way back to April, uh, we, we saw that, that, that there was a variety of feelings but mostly in the calm to good, to some stoked, and that's kind of where we want to be. Uh, and we do need to be a little bit terrified and we do need to be a little bit anxious as well. So we, we appreciate you sharing how you feel. Again, all of our, um, our polls are going to be um, anonymous. So you can tell us exactly how you feel on that. We won't know who it is. So uh, I guess we can stop sharing that. And before we give you the tour of Sahali, I would like to show you a little bit of what, what you're gonna see.
Welcome to Sahali! Well, I'm super stoked about uh, Sahali. We've needed this lodge for a long time. Sahali is a great space. 23,500 square feet of space we've added, you know, with our guests in mind. The building site is 100% uh, on previously disturbed ground. The way we have Sahali set up and this new building, it is really kind of cutting edge in the rental industry. The wood you see here on the wall was old materials used to support some of our outside lift structures. This is one of the exciting innovations that we've seen at a few other resorts and I'm so excited to have it here at Mount Hood Meadows. We are at the Sahali Grill and it, it is an amazing space designed for the skier and rider. The building is actually helping to recharge these wetlands and reinvigorate the wetlands uh, through the capturing and the treatment of the snowmelt. It lends itself to its natural beauty, brings outside in, you can look out, and it's also a conditioned space, so you can be comfortable here in the summer. Sahali is a huge first step uh, to really making an awesome summer experience up here for hosting corporate events, weddings, group events. Deck is an amazing spot. It's heated. The deck has spectacular views of the top of Mount Hood. This is going to be a, a yet another really great gathering place for our guests both uh, winter and summer. We can exchange the air inside this building six different times per hour. There are not that many outdoor sports you can do during the winter and skiing and riding is one of the few, but it's going to be an awesome one for our current situation. This is going to be a very lively animated uh, environment here. We're so excited about this upcoming season. You know, we want people to get back to some kind of normal. We know how good skiing and riding makes you feel. I'm Jeremy Risk. I'm Greg Pack. I'm Matthew Drake, Chairman and CEO of Mount Hood Meadows. And this is your mountain home. Now we are going to take you live and direct to Sahali with uh, Jeremy Riss, our Vice President of Resort Operations. Take it away, Jeremy, and don't forget to tell us about a memorable experience. Awesome, Dave. Thanks. I'm Jeremy Riss. I'm the Vice President of Resort Operations. I'm going to take you on a little tour of Sahali. I'll go ahead and take my mask off so you can hear me better since I'm the only one on this floor here. Uh, memorable experience, I have so many of them. I've been at Mount Hood Meadows for, I think this will be my 27th season this year. But uh, you know, when I think of my most memorable experience right now, what comes to mind is teaching my daughter Daisy how to ski on the magic carpet. That was uh, so much fun and it's so fun watching her learn to ski and enjoy the sport just like I did. I'm gonna go ahead and I'm on the main entry vestibule of Sahali here. And I'm gonna to start to take you on a little bit of a tour. Uh, but first I wanna show you outside because I know this is what we're all really most excited about. Is there, it is definitely quite a bit of snow accumulated today and it's gonna be a fun chore getting our cars out this evening when we leave. But as we enter Sahali here, this is the main entry vestibule. This is going to be a large video wall here that's going to display directional signage and information. Those are a couple 85 inch TVs that we're going to mount uh, upstairs in the, in the culinary level for watching sports, things like that. As you walk in here, this is going to be our main point of sale desk right here. Uh, we won't be using this quite as much this season because all our lessons and rentals and tickets are all going to be sold online in advance this year. And so when you uh, enter, you'll purchase online and you're gonna head around this way over to the rental area. And you may have saw in that little teaser video, uh, the boot bridge here. This is gonna be a really awesome innovation for us because as you walk up on this boot bridge, you're going to take off your shoes and our uh, rental technicians are actually gonna fit your boots for you right on the boot bridge. And this is, makes it easier for them to fit you so that they don't have to sit bend down on the floor on their knees. And you're gonna be able to just uh, stand there on the boot bridge, kind of walk off and it'll be a very efficient process for getting folks in new boots this year, in the rental boots this year. As you get off the boot bridge, right around the corner here, this is where we'll store all our helmets and you'll get fitted with the helmet right over here. And then after you get fitted with the helmet, we've got lockers for folks to put all their gear in. And one of the, things I'm so per, super excited about this season with our new rental shop is you're going to have your boots on and all your gear, but you're not going to have your skis or board yet until you walk outside. You'll walk out here onto the snow and we'll have your skis or your board waiting for you out on the snow so you don't have to deal with carrying it inside the lodge, which I think is going to be awesome for our guests. And 
I'll show you a little back of the house area here. This is going to be our tech room. So this is, as you get in front of your boots, this is where our technicians are going to be teching your skis. And this is a door where they'll take them out right outside onto the snow uh, to have waiting for you. You know, one of the things I always see with our beginners is uh, they've got their goggles up and they don't have their gloves on and we hand them their skis and then they walk outside and the first thing that hits them is the cold air and they have to pull down their goggles and gloves and they drop their skis so I think this is going to be a way better experience. In here this is our new children's learning center which is going to be awesome. This season uh, er all our lessons are going to meet on snow but uh, those that are taking lessons that are renting, this is where we're going to have you boot up in here and have some little cubbies for you to store your gear. And uh, this will also be some open seating for, for lunch. During the summer, this is going to be an area that we uh, use for our kids' educational camps, which is going to be awesome. It's going to be so nice this summer to be in this building because it has air conditioning. It'll actually be a comfortable environment up here during the summer. And it's going to be great for uh, hosting corporate and group events and weddings. Uh, and other meetings up here. I'm now I'm going to turn it over to Greg Pack, and he's going to take you through the second level of Sahali. Thanks, Jeremy. Uh, hi, I'm Greg. Good to see you guys today. I'm going to start in the Alpenstube is where I'm at. Uh, but first, I'll tell you a little bit about me. I'm, uh, uh, I've only worked here a year as a general manager, but absolutely love it. My favorite, uh, you know, memory uh, is actually one of the, the same as the other guys with my daughters. I have two daughters are both one's 19, the other's 22. And the first day we we're all able to ski together, you know, with my wife as a family and ski black diamond terrain. It was in big sky, Montana at moonlight basin, a resort I was running was one of my happiest days on skis to, you know, be off the, the bunny hill, the blue slopes, but as a family to ski some black diamond terrain, you know, as a family and keep laughing, it uh, was absolutely awesome and, and uh, love that experience. I'm gonna start from uh, the, the Alp and, and give you a view. Right now, you'll be able to see, you know, this is outside Sahali. You saw Jeremy showed you right outside the door. You can see the sky bridge going from there. And you're very familiar with the Alpen Stube. Uh, you know, great space that we have in here. We're actually making some changes and putting up some uh, some barriers to make some more separation with our seating. So we're going to half capacity in here. You see Jeremy just heading uh, just outside. And as we go from the Alpenstube and the South Lodge, we're headed right over the Sky Bridge down to the new lodge. This is my dramatic pause. On the Sky Bridge, you can look out you can see the snow, you can actually ski right to below this surface right here. And take off your skis and then go to the parking lot or out the other side. There you're looking back at the North and South Lodge and our parking drop off area. That's something else that's changing this year. We're actually doing a whole parking drop off situation. So we don't have so many people on the shuttle buses uh, and we can limit that, but we are creating huge uh, drop off area with multiple lanes. So if you have people in your cars, you can drop them off up front here and then only have one person go out to our exterior lots to get shuttled back in. As we walk into Sahali Lodge on this level, uh, this is Wildflowers Cafe. That sign is actually going to be moved down one level. This beam ended up being higher, but these beams came from our yellow lift. So repurposed, they're in our boneyard. We pulled them out, had them refinished, stuck them in here, and then this will be Wildflowers Cafe. If you want to get a coffee, a smoothie, you know, anything along those lines, we have it all there for you. You can see the menu, four different kinds of smoothies. If you want to get something simple to go in the morning, we got it for you. Any kind of coffee you want, going to be a great space. But that's Wildflowers Cafe. You walk in here to the waterfall room. You can see the big, huge glass windows looking outside so you can watch people skiing down as you're sitting in here dining. Again, we'll have tables set throughout here and at half capacity and spread out. You can see outside right now with snow on the tables, but not much. And I'll show you that deck here in a second. Beautiful log fireplace, again, with some reclaimed uh, mantle beams, again, from the yellow lift. Uh, we repurposed those and put them in here. But if you want to warm up, a great place to get cozy and look at the fire. These stairs right here go right down to the level where Jeremy showed you. 
uh, our rental area and ski school check-in desk and the children's learning center. If you wanna go upstairs from here, the Raptors Roost is a beautiful place to hang out. It's a mezzanine, you know, right up here. If you wanna get a view from above and look down upon everybody else and hang out out there, you can. Uh, and hang out is a relative term. We're asking everybody this year not to hang out too much in the lodge to make room for other people to come in. Obviously space is gonna be confined and we wanna make sure we do everything possible to make it a great experience, but we also want it to be a quick experience so people can kind of get in and out. Looking out the beautiful doors, also on this level and directly below, we have uh, men's and women's restroom and a family style restroom. I don't think I need to take you on a tour of that. That's my guess is you don't wanna see that. If you wanna go outside onto the deck, as you saw in the video, we have deck seating out here. We'll have uh, fire pits as well. We have the lids that were just actually sitting there on the floor. So we'll have outdoor heated fire pits to warm up on. And, and we've also bought some other heaters to be able to place around the deck to keep you warm. But again, it's heated. So the snow melts right off of it. Um, and if you come up here on the deck and you don't wanna go inside the lodge, something you can do too, Right here, we got the Bullwheel Bar. You wanna get a to-go drink right here to be able to drink out on the deck on our licensed premise? You sure can, just come up here to the window and order. Here. As we come back inside, I'm gonna show you the Sahali Grill. So this is our scramble area. This is something we're extremely excited about. This area was designed so you can go in, you know, take your time at each station, look around, great what you want, and then come out and check out through two double-sided cashiers <clears throat> so they can handle it. We are again limiting the space in here. I think we're limiting to 15 people in here at one time. But if you wanna come in, you know, in the morning, you know, we have this great breakfast menu for you. So if you want chicken and waffles, we got it for you. You know, you just wanna get a chorizo burrito, one of my favorites, we have it for you. I'm gonna kind of give you a behind the scenes tour of our kitchen equipment, maybe a little loud, but uh, down here, we'll have a south of the border station. So if you wanna grab, you know, some tacos, a taco platter, burrito, nachos, salad, uh, all kind of awesome stuff being made right in front of you, right here. Um, the grill's going hot, you know, right behind me. If you're not into Mexican and you want something different, we have uh, the Far East menu for you. So if you want ramen, a, a ramen bowl, or Thai citrus chicken, or short ribs, uh, you know, we'll cook it up in that walk for you, get you all set up out front. If you want more uh, just standard cuisine, we have the Mountain Grill. The Mountain Grill has barbecued chicken sandwiches, a Kobe cheesesteak burger, uh, an Impossible Burger, uh, a lot of great stuff for you to have. And I, as always, we have great fries. And then right here, a little piece of Italy. We're going to have pizza for you, meatball subs, salads, all some great stuff you can have right here. And we purchased this oven from Italy. It actually burns at, I think, 700 degrees normal. I turned it on. It's about 600. Hope they don't mind I'm trying to burn it in. But incredible pizza oven. Oh, my phone's melting. Beautiful pizza oven to be able to service you quick. I'm going to give you a back of the house tour. It's all high end stuff. We made sure that this space was comfortable for our, our team so they could service you well. So plenty of space, uh, high end equipment to be able to service you. Come right back out here into the scramble area. Uh, you know, we'll have soft drinks and everything else set up here to your left. Some other grab and go items in the cooler. If you just want something quick and to, to get in and out of here. We're also gonna have other grab and go food options uh, throughout the outside of the lodges and also some other remote beer setups. So you can grab a drink or grab something quick and go if you don't wanna hang out in the lodge. We respect that and wanna make sure we're still able to service you. But next, you know, here's the Bullwheel Bar. So that, uh, that Bullwheel was pulled off of the old Hood River Express lift right there. So again, if you don't wanna go in the bar, there's a bar service window right there. If you just wanna grab something from a to-go window. So we have two to-go windows, one on the inside, one on the outside. But if you wanna come in here and hang out, incredible space, another beautiful fireplace. You know, the mantle's done. We'll have some artwork in here, you know, representing uh, you know, our lifts and the tremendous amount of work that the team and our guys put in, you know, to put this thing together, you know, to make the lifts run every day, but it's a tribute to them um, and their efforts and work. And then behind here, an incredible bar, you know, some nice high-end cocktails, drinks. Uh, we have 
I believe 24 taps available for uh, our bartenders to be able to service you. So we'll try to get you in and out of here quick. Um, and you know, we got, we have stuff in here. All right, perfect. I think my part's over. I got some other work to do. Looks like I may be busy for, eh, give me an hour or two, hour and a half. Uh, but right now I'm gonna turn it over to Matthew Drake, our chairman and CEO of the board. Matthew, the show is all yours. Well, thanks, Greg. And uh, just thanks uh, to our Sahali Gold Pass holders because uh, this is a pretty momentous occasion for Mountain Meadows and we just wouldn't be here without your support. Uh, your confidence in us, uh, your confidence in our team, um, our design team, our contractor, uh, everybody worked through, uh, let's face it, um, less than ideal conditions between a pandemic and wildfires and all the resulting impacts that that caused. Um, it's been a challenge, you know, to deliver this building, but the, the loyalty and the dedication uh, that you have shown to the company was um, really respected and taken very seriously by our team the Mountain Meadows team and our contractor, and we're so pleased uh, to deliver this building, which we think you'll be very proud of, and we hope it'll be worthy of your confidence and your investment, and we're delivering it, delivering it to you on time and within budget. So thank you. So I guess uh, Dave's got a few slides here that he wanted me to talk about, um, which I'm happy to do. And then of course, answer any questions. And this slide uh, just really shows Sahali's uh, location and its footprint. And it is totally true that uh, we used a completely um, uh, previously disturbed footprint for this building um, that was part of the original construction of Mountain Meadows in 1968. And, uh, you can kind of see its proximity there to the, the buildings uh, that are existing and the hill and the natural environment. Um, this was very important so we can provide guest connectivity and also connectivity for our staff and moving materials around. Uh, also utilities are a big issue, you know, for us, uh, everything is undergrounded. Uh, all the services and utilities um, uh, to the building are, you know, secured and underground utilidors. And um, the space that you see that is on the down portion of the photo where there's some lifts, this, this picture is a little bit dated, but there's nothing there now. That is where the rain garden is located. And the green area that you see there is all wetland. And you can kind of see faintly a, uh, an orange fence there. That's the wetland, uh, delineated wetland barrier. That fence is now gone. And what we've done is we've integrated the wetland into two uh, tiered uh, ponds, which are sediment ponds, which, which allow the water to be filtered before it is then uh, slowly reintroduced into the wetlands. And the idea is, is that we're taking the uh, snowfall and the snow melt from the roof and the surrounding area of the building footprint and collecting that into these rain gardens and recharging the tiered wetlands. And for those of you who have been around a while, you know that Mountain Meadows is called Mountain Meadows because we are, our, our special use permit area is simply uh, an assortment and a combination of uh, tiered high alpine wetlands that filter the drinking water for not only the upper valley, uh, but for a large portion of our region. And uh, it's a, the, the hydrology of our permit area is, um, is very important. So um, that's a big deal for Sahali and we're very proud of this engineering, which um, is rather unique in ski country. Uh, so here we have uh, some uh, just more examples of repurposed items. So uh, starting on the left is the uh, is the the stonework and so forth, and our recycling program. In the center, you can see the beautiful woodwork uh, that was done. All of the interior finished wood for the building came from the timbers, which were quite large, that held up the old yellow chair lower terminal. And for those of you who've been around a while, you know that that was quite a large building. Each of those timbers was basically a tree because it was constructed in 1967. And when we demolished the building, we salvaged all those timbers, we stored them, uh, we prepared them, and, uh, and we have uh, milled them and repurposed them for this building. Uh, to the right is one of the corbels uh, for the uh, Bullwill Bar fireplace. And um, that corbel was designed um, uh, by Marshall Woods, who is our manager of our, of our lift department. And they were constructed uh, by Hunter Dahlberg, who is the uh, principal craftsman of Orion Forge out of uh, Bend. And uh, 
those guys, uh, they took basically parts and pieces that we have that we saved thinking that we could maybe use portions of them and created the corbels. And this is a functioning uh, bearing gear and you can put your hand in there and actually turn it. And the Bullwheel Bar is all about celebrating our vertical transportation system and the men and women that so uh, uh, in, in such a loyal and dedicated fashion uh, support our lifts by maintaining them, by repairing them, building new lifts and all the machinery. You know, the sport is really, a, it's a great sport, but without really a reliable vertical transportation system, it would be a challenging day. Um, certainly a very fatiguing day. And so this, this room is all about celebrating everything that it takes uh, to run the lifts. And it's all about teaching our guests and our guest children uh, about that so that they understand that um, sometimes these parts break, sometimes the weather causes them to have problems and so forth. Uh, but this is all about educating our guests of what does it take to operate, uh, successfully operate a ski resort. So I just want to reiterate my strong thanks to you for your commitment to Mountain Meadows, your loyalty, your investment in this beautiful building. I hope when you actually see it and get to enjoy the space, it will make you really proud. I guess I'll turn it back over to Matt, huh? Thanks, Matthew. Yeah, uh, we have, we have right. another we have another poll coming up. Uh, now that you have a, a chance to see the building. Uh, what are your top three favorite aspects of Sahali? And we just threw some on there, but we'd like to get some feedback from our, from our room. And uh, good that, that coming in. So uh, a little bit about myself. Uh, I'm the vice president of sales and marketing here at Mount Hood Meadows. Uh, this is my 26th season that I'm going into. Uh, came here after working at ski resorts in Colorado and New Mexico. Um, and uh, originally grew up in Minnesota. My first uh, ski run was on Buck Hill. <laughs> Not my most memorable. Uh, first time on a chairlift, I fell off it. So, but, uh, and then since I've been at Mount Hood Meadows, I've fallen off a chair three times. And uh, all of them were with people that I was having a lot of fun <laughs> and trying to impress. So there we go. Uh, probably my most memorable experiences with an event and the event that everybody remembers is the pond skim. But uh, I got to tell you uh, the event, uh, and I love the pond skim and I can't wait you know, to hopefully get a chance to, to do that again this upcoming season since we didn't last year. But one of the events that we did early on when I was here was called uh, Meadows Madness. And it was a March event, a spring break event, a family event. And um, we had a lot of uh, Frisbees and, and uh, we, we had Pogs that were giving away in contests. And uh, we're throwing a Frisbee up and there was a, two brothers, young kids. Uh, one of them caught a Frisbee. And he said to the others, they're walking by me, he said, this is the best day of my life. And uh, you know, uh, I thoroughly enjoyed uh, the, the feeling of being able to be part of making something so special for someone. And, uh, and really all it took was, was a Frisbee, but everything that went around about that too. So, um, uh, so how, sharing our poll results here, looks like makes more space in our existing lodges is the big winner there with 75%. Uh, you were able to vote more than once on this. The deck, uh, I agree with you. But I'm so looking forward to uh, not just the winter activities, but the summer activities that we're going to be able to have. It's a great meeting center, and the deck is a great breakout space. We're going to be using it for weddings. We're going to be using it for uh, get-togethers um, on a year-round basis. The year-round functionality of the building is, is what I'm really looking for, forward to. And thank you for recognizing the design that went into the building with the thought about the snow melt and uh, the rain garden. I don't know if Matthew really uh, mentioned too about the, the deck being or the roof being flat and you know the concerns of a pitched roof and how many stories would be falling onto potential people beneath and they solved it all in the design. So um, great thought in the way that this uh, building was put together. 
Uh, and uh, thanks for, for that feedback. We look forward to sharing it. We still have more questions and answers coming in or Q's uh, questions coming in and we'll be addressing them as we go on through the, uh, uh, through the presentation. So uh, we're gonna move on now and, and talk a little bit about uh, 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 the upcoming season and uh, I need to figure out how to share my screen again. <laughs> there it is. And uh, we talked about a little bit about the crop, the coronavirus readiness operational plan, but really we've been working on this since last April. And I'm gonna turn it over to Mel Tony, our vice president of mountain operations. She's gonna tell you a little about uh, what we've got planned for you for this season. Thanks Dave. Hi, I'm Mel Tony, and um, I started in the ski industry racing on high school in high school and all through college. I spent several years as a shop tech at uh, several different ski shops, both in Montana and Oregon. And after a brief stint at a real job in the city, I returned to the ski industry as a ski patroller at Mount Hood Meadows. That was 22 years ago, and I haven't left, and I'm heading into my 23rd season. Um, some of my most memorable moments at Mount Hood Meadows were watching my kids grow up from tiny tots working on their french fries and pizzas in daycare to um, working themselves in the CLC. So, and some of the things I enjoy most about Mount Hood Meadows are the sunrises, the really fantastic and challenging weather, and that every day is different and brings a new set of challenges. So it's, it's an exciting place to work and not without significant challenges almost every day. Um, last season the, and the current pandemic have created some of our biggest challenges yet. Um, we started working on this um, corona ready, coronavirus readiness operational plan, basically the moment we knew we weren't gonna reopen last season. Uh, we have a task force involving each department and they developed and evolved plans over the summer. So things are gonna look different this winter. It's a shared responsibility with our team and our guests. We're religiously practicing the three W's, which is watch your distance, stay six feet apart whenever possible. Wear a mask indoors, in the lift lines, on lifts, in parking lots, on our transportation, and outside whenever you can't maintain six feet of dif different distance from those not in your party or family. And wash your hands. Wash your hands or sanitize frequently. We worked really hard this summer and fall to kind of figure out what we were gonna do with, um, whether we were gonna do a reservation system or how we were gonna manage visits up here. Um, and Jeremy Riss did an amazing job of analyzing our past his visits hour by hour to determine our peak, peak hours and who was here during those times, pass holders versus day ticket holders. And we're working to spread out those day tickets to be date and time specific and limit, limiting inventory pools for those time slots based on historical data, weather, weather forecasts, quality of snow powder days, or weather that will likely limit upper mountain operations. So the volume management would be to limit the number of guests riding at any given time, spreading out the demand by day of the week and time of day. We've got some pretty big changes in the parking lot. Um, as Greg mentioned earlier, we're um, putting in a drop-off zone. So there'll be a couple lanes for people to come in and drop off the other part, you know, the other occupants of their vehicle and then drive to a, either further out in the main lot or to one of the outlying lots and ride a shuttle back to the base area. You know, that allows for fewer riders on our buses. Uh, we want no unattended vehicles in that drop-off zone. So it's kind of like the airport. Um, you're just picking up or dropping off in those zones. And as always, we still have one way flow in the parking lot. Another big change is we're moving our overnight parking, so RV overnight parking to the sunrise lot. We will have an additional dog park down there for those of you that are taking advantage of that and wanna uh, play with your dog during the day or while you're staying overnight. This will open up additional spots in the main lot leading to fewer, fewer shuttles or fewer people needing the shuttles. And RV use in the, day, in, our, in the main lot will be limited to vehicles that are seven feet wide and 20 feet long. So if you have a vehicle that's bigger than that, we're gonna ask you on peak days to park in the sunrise lot. 
that is to maximize the number of vehicles we can get in the main lot. We'll be adding additional restrooms or porta potties in all of the lots so that um, people are not having to go indoors to use those facilities. For the lift lines, uh, we're trying some new things and it's hard to say how it will work until we get, you know, get the snow, enough snow to set things up. So expect changes. We're gonna be likely adding ghost lanes to separate the, the lines. And we will accommodate those that would like to ride alone or only with those in their own party. But otherwise we will be loading two to four, two or four to a chair as, as um, the chair is designed. And again, masks, you know, we're, we're asking people to wear a mask in the parking lot, in the lift lines, on, on the chairlift, anywhere outside where you can't maintain six feet of distance and always in the lodge, unless you're actively sitting down and eating. The three C's, so this is something we wanna avoid as part of um, avoiding contracting coronavirus. I'm sure most people have heard this before, but avoiding closed spaces with poor ventilation. We've upgraded the HVAC system in the North and South lodges to, to help with that. Um, avoid crowded spaces, so we're limiting lodge and food service capacities and avoid close contact settings. So Ski Well, Be Well is an initiative developed by the National Ski Area Association. It's been adopted by most ski areas in the in the United States, including Mount Hood Meadows. And it reinforces all of the procedure, procedures we've developed. So face covering, social distancing. And, you know, the, we do wellness checks for our employees. So the employee, the safety of everyone is very important to us, but this is a shared responsibility. So we, we've put a lot of work into these plans, um, something we've worked on all summer. And as things have changed, so rapidly as we learn new things, we need to um, be nimble and flexible and you know, work hard to, to do, as, do the best we can to keep each other safe. So act vigilant, be vigilant, act like everybody has it, wear your mask, stay, stay as far apart as you can. And uh, we will do our best to communicate with you guys as, as changes come up. And um, we're managing a big risk and hopefully things go well and we can all have an enjoyable and awesome ski season. All right, <clears throat> thanks, Belle. And I'm sure there may be some questions about that. We can put them into the room and uh, if there were any questions that weren't answered, we'll be happy to answer them. Uh, right now, I want to introduce our guest services manager, Lisa Cordy. She's going to be talking a little bit about Sahali Pass, and uh, uh, but Lisa, first introduce yourself. Mm -hmm. You'll tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, a memorable experience that you've had on the mountain or outdoors <laughs> or uh, recreating. I I can do that. So I am Lisa Cordy, and I am the guest services manager, and as well, I'm the director of our daycare. So I started at Mount Hood Meadows in 1999 when the daycare opened. So my favorite memories tend to revolve around children. Um, many of you probably had children come through the daycare, and I have been able to watch the children in the daycare go from babies all the way to working in our children's learning center, in our rental shop, in guest services now, um, kind of all over the place. So, but my first favorite memory at Mount Hood Meadows was New Year's Eve, 1999. And 1999, we were all thinking the internet was gonna crash or something funny was gonna happen. And I just remember being there past midnight and being there to watch the fireworks. And back then in 1999, we still did that torchlight parade with the skiers who would follow down kind of in line with fire in their hands, which I can't even imagine doing now. But I remember just being in awe watching that happen. So those are my favorite things. Um, Dave, can you share the screen about the Sahali benefit stuff? 
Thank you. So as far as our Sahali Pass carry forward, any of the unused bonus or buddy tickets from last season are going to be eligible to be used during this season. Now you can't see those on the website. And if you don't know how many you have, um, the email for Sahali Pass holders that gets you right to the people who can give you your answer is sahali at skihood.com. So if you need to know how many bonus tickets or buddy tickets you might have from last season, or you're not getting our emails, um, just email sahali at skihood.com and someone on our team will try to answer your question as quickly as we can get to that. So anything you had left from last season, there was a little bit of confusion because for our regular pass holders, those tickets are only good for the first three weeks of the season. So most of the stuff that you see says come the first three weeks, but for Sahali, it is for the entire season. So if you have any of your bonus tickets or your buddy tickets that are unused, they are eligible for the entire 2021 season. And in addition to that, we have added four unrestricted bonus tickets. So those are tickets that can be used at any time. And usually you get two of those. So we're giving four this season and four restricted bonus tickets. So the restricted bonus tickets are the ones that follow the value pass times. So they're good after 2 p.m. every day. And then on the weekends in January and February through March 7th, they're not good until that 2 p.m., but they're good the mid midweek days, and then they're not good on President's Day or MLK Day until 2 p.m. So we kind of think of it as our, as our midweek pass, spring pass, and night pass kind of all wrapped into one. Um, so those are the four restricted bonus tickets, and then we also have five buddy tickets. Those are the discounted tickets, and we are developing um, so that you can request those ahead of time. There will be a link online that you will fill out. And we ask that you do that by 4 p.m. the day before so that we can have that prepared for your guests to come and join you on the mountain. So you'll have to go onto the website, find the link, which should be um, with the Sahali information. And then we'll fill up, we'll start an order for your, for your, guest and we'll email you with whatever information you're going to need. If your guest already has a piece of media, we'll be able to load that day right on their media and then they don't even have to come and see us. But if they don't have a piece of media, they are going to have to come see us the first time in order to get that ticket to, for us to be able to reload another time. And then the last thing I was going to talk about was um, reassigning your Sahali pass. So one of the benefits of Sahali is if you don't want to use your pass, if you're injured or you have to move for work or take an extended vacation or whatever your reason, you can reassign that to someone else for the season. The following season that will return to you. Now, if you're reassigning that to someone whose age is in a more expensive pass category, there is a $125 transfer fee. To reassign your pass, there is um, a link online and it was also sent to you in the email or you can send us an email to the Sahali at skihood.com and we'll send you that link. And we haven't done any of the reassignments for this season yet. You'll know when we do them because we send you an email and the email has all the information on it that both you need to know as well as who you reassigned it needs to know in order to get everything ready to go for the season. And this season, we are mailing passes to people that would like their pass mailed to them. So we'll include that link if they want to have their download their picture and have the pass mailed out to them if they have time before they're going to make their visit. And that information is also on our web page. And I think that's all I have for you. Thanks, Lisa. You yeah. know, there's been a couple of questions of people asking about uh, carrying forward uh, their Sahali Pass, uh, making this a skip year. We're just not in a position to be able to do that uh, with this pass uh, because basically we put uh, all of our planning together financially and otherwise in order to bring into fruition this building and uh, have modeled around it. 
Obviously, this is extraordinary circumstances, but we also feel that's where the reassigning your Sahali Pass comes in. And uh, we know that there are a lot of people out there that are still looking for passes. Uh, and uh, we're hopeful that you, you have friends that you can reassign to if you, know, you feel that um, you're not comfortable with, with uh, you know, riding up at Meadows this season because of the, the environment or the coronavirus. Uh, but at this point, the reassigning your Sahali Pass is the solution that we have right now. Um, and we don't have a skip year option for the Sahali Pass. Uh, I want to introduce uh, now uh, Katie Cadlam. And uh, uh, Katie is our Director of Business Development. And she is going to talk a little bit about um, some of the events that you know, we've, we've been trying to put together. <laughs> uh, take it away, Katie. And don't forget to tell us about one of your memorable experiences. Thank you, Dave. Yes, I'm Katie Cadlove, Director of Business Development. This is my ninth season at Mount Hood Meadows. Um, that was a tough question when Dave asked, what is our most memorable moment? I've raised pretty much all of my family now um, at the mountain. My oldest two girls started in Snow Blasters and both have worked in the, the Children's Learning Center. Um, and my oldest even started teaching two years ago, which was very exciting. And our two littles are in daycare still. Um, I think the family aspect of the mountain is always what keeps me uh, excited and energized. And I can't not share, and we all know that feeling when you come around on the access road and it's a bluebird day and you see the mountain and it just, you feel it all the way through you. And that's something that no matter how many times I'm up there and Jeremy laughs at me every time we're driving to the mountain and I take a picture, like I have a thousand of the same picture, but it always just is magical to me. Um, so, you know, last year I got cut short and we were, Pretty disappointed we weren't able to provide some of the the events that we were hoping to do certainly a lot of the early loads that everyone was expecting and so you know COVID hitting and us trying to figure out how we can still give you guys the benefits that you were expecting when you invested in this pass and in this lodge you know this year we really our focus is going to be trying to get those early loads to you guys and right now we can't commit to a specific date as we all know uh, snow coverage is a huge uh, aspect of that and just making sure that we are able to be compliant with our COVID protocols and um, and, and obviously that's there's always the uh, the safety of getting people on the mountain early with any avalanche mitigation or any other safety things that we need to do. So of course we'd like to do one before the holidays and we'll just have to see what the what the snow brings us. Um, as far as other events, we all know with COVID, those are gonna be have to be on standby. So we'll look at different things that we can do for you guys throughout the season to really show our appreciation of you guys for your investment and commitment to your mountain home. All right. Thanks, Dave. You're welcome. Uh, we're going to get into uh, some uh, uh, Q and A. Um, I think some of the questions have have already been answered, and then we have another poll question to ask everybody as well. So um, let's see. Uh, I know Cameron had the question about being able to carry over uh, the um, uh, the past to the next year, and and uh, you know, reassigning is going to be the the option uh, that uh, that we're going to have to provide for for this. Um, uh, so Bob had asked, with the current spikes in COVID, if the government clamps down, how long or how low can you go to further limit capacity and still remain open? You know, some of those are are a little bit beyond our control, um, and it and we feel that it probably affects more of our indoor um, operations than it does our outdoor operations. And uh, I think we are uh, fully prepared to take everything outdoors if we need to. You know, Ashland this year, they're not operating any indoor operations. They're not running any of their restaurants. You can't even go in their lodge to use the restroom. Everything is outdoors. 
So we have plans all the way down to, hey, we're just running lifts, you know, and, and uh, certainly uh, there could be some uh, numbers that come out or some um, uh, maximum amount of people in one place. I mean, it's up to us to try to do our best to keep everybody spread out. And there's going to be a certain amount of responsibility shared with our guests. We, we certainly don't want to turn into that you know, Italian ski area that opened, I think, on the 24th of October. Had so many people lined up and so many crowds, they shut it down the next day and they're not going to reopen again until the, until the end of November. So, you know, in our, in our lift mazes, uh, we talked about uh, ghost lanes and spreading it out. And, you know, the, the lift line may look enormous because we want to have six feet in front of you and behind you too, between you and your parties uh, that you're not with. So that's really going to take up a lot more space. I personally don't think that the, uh, the lift ride is going, or the uh, lift weight is going to be that much longer. It's going to feel like it because you're going to be so spread out. But um, I personally will be wearing a mask and I'm actually going to then put um, uh, the, the tube that I normally wear, the, the gator. I always wear a gator. I wear it because uh, it protects me when it's cold and it protects my face from the sun. It also protects uh, others from seeing my face, which you know, a lot of people really appreciate. So uh, uh, that's what I'm gonna, I'm gonna be doing. Uh, and I will have no qualms at all sitting on a chairlift that's probably going somewhere around 10 to 12 miles an hour um, in a very well ventilated space for a five to eight minute ride even with people that I don't know, as long as they're wearing their masks, I'm wearing my mask and I'm not breathing on them and they're not breathing on me. So I actually think that our um, throughput on our lifts is gonna go better than what we're thinking. But I also think that the lines are gonna look a lot longer. So this is the year that we just need to be patient you know, for that. Um, are the, uh, what beer is that? <laughs> Chuck, who are you asking on that? Uh, maybe that was uh, a question to Greg. What beer was that, Greg? That was me, Dave. I didn't pay close enough attention. Sorry about that. It looked <laughs> good, though. I didn't drink it. I got to drive tonight. <laughs> but what beer was it? <laughs> we did do a collab with Double Mountain this year, and we will have a Bull Wheel IPA when we are All closed. right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, are the 2020 Sahali Pass info you are sharing on the web page? Um, uh, no, but I'm sure that we can. Yeah, 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 it is. Uh, in fact, that was put together, if you come to think of it, last, I think, March 22nd is when we notified everybody of what our intentions were going to be with the carryovers and, and uh, what we're providing our, our pass holders. And it's in the Sahali section of our website, which is under the resort section. Um, does the Sahali Pass fall under the 100-day guarantee thing that uh, you give a prorated refund if there aren't any or uh, aren't at least 100 open days, if I'm remembering that right? Hmm, I haven't anticipated that one. Um, Lisa almost looked like she was going to say something there. Didn't have the <laughs> answer there. <laughs> uh, that's something, I guess, that we would need to consider um, at the time. And, uh, you know, that would also be... Uh, extraordinary type of a case and uh, all of our pass holders or solid pass holders are extraordinary people so we have to get together and do the right thing at that point huh Matthew so um, thank you would be amazing to be able to get a cup of coffee outside in the a.m. that is my main reason for going to Herm uh, Jeremy I think you probably have a bit of an update too about you know okay we get this beautiful new facility but you know, we have all this space now in the North and South Lodge that we've vacated uh, to give us more room in there. What's some of the plans for uh, culinary services and food outlets beyond Sahali? Well, uh, we're definitely planning to still operate our other food outlets that we have in our existing lodges. And in addition to that, uh, we're going to be setting up some food sales outdoors, uh, both in the breezeway as you're walking up in the morning to be able to get breakfast burritos and things like that and out on the deck as well. Uh, down at Herm, we'll have a, a food truck as well. So there be some great options for getting food outdoors uh, if you wanna stay outside. And then uh, we'll also have a lot more capacity indoors. We're basically adding all of the Sahali culinary services and keeping what we had in addition to that. Mm. Uh 
question, and, and I think I'll throw this one to Katie. I think she has the answer, but does Sahali work for the reciprocal resorts and any restrictions? There are no restrictions on the Sahali pass holders. You have access to all the reciprocals, which this year we have Whitefish and uh, Mount Baker. Mm -hmm. With uh, Mount Baker, though, we do have, it, it starts, what, after uh, Christmas and then, uh, or are there any restrictions on the weekends in January and February? Um, I believe there are restrictions at, it's the same that we've done in the past with them. There are restrictions during holidays, peak weekends, January, February, and then it's open to every day of the week after, I believe, the first weekend in March. Yep. That so, is on our website. Yep. Uh, and we did pare it down this year from where we've been in the past because we just didn't want to be obligated to a whole lot of other resorts and their pass holders because we are really serious about giving our best um, uh, uh, factual uh, data-driven uh, estimation of what our uh, uh, capacities are going to be every single day. And uh, if we had too many wild cards and variables because we got seven or eight or 10 or 12 other resorts and all of a sudden we got all of their people showing up, we just wouldn't have a good way of being able to manage that. So we uh, chose our two most popular partners in Mount Baker and Whitefish. And we hope that you all have a chance to enjoy their hospitality this year as well. So there is a lot of evidence to show that neck gaiters are not good masks. What will you do about that? Um, well, I've got some really good videos uh, that were put together by uh, basically uh, aerosol engineer, Lindsay Mars, and you can look her up and she's got some great stuff. The original evidence that came out about neck gaiters was incorrectly done. I think it was Dartmouth College. Uh, there's been a lot of comments on it. You can hashtag uh, gator gate. In fact, uh, but what we want is people to use a double layer or at least fold over the net gator. Um, they have shown uh, through many tests since that original one that they're almost as effective as a two layer or three layer mask. Not as effective as a surgical mask and certainly not as effective as an N95. But again, the most important thing we're trying to do is to prevent, um, you know, that um, uh, uh, the, the mass is going to prevent the cough, the sneeze, the, you know, a lot of droplets going out and will also help reduce uh, some of the aerosol as well. Me personally, I may wear an N95 underneath my gator, you know, uh, but I, that's a personal decision as well. So will Sahali pass holders have some early lift starts? Hey, Katie. Hey, Mel. What about that? In short, yes. When? We don't know. <laughs> as yes. soon as we can. As soon as we can. Last year was a bust with the, the wind we had and then all the crazy weather. So we'll do our best. And I know that's important to, to all of you guys and, and something that we want to do for you. So we will, we will do our best to make those happen this season. The, the one thing we need to do is to see how we're operating in the COVID environment. We do plan early loads on our Herm on the peak days again to help distribute the arrival on those peak days. So um, in addition to that, we'll look at uh, once we pace ourselves, once we, we get into our routine, once we know that we're managing things well, then we will add those early loads for um, our Sahali pass holders. But we are planning on it. We just can't tell you what dates yet. Uh, this is for Mel. Can we get a wind direction on the weather report? Very important uh, when considering avalanche conditions and what slopes are icy or loaded. I was just typing a, an answer to that, but yes, I mean you can if you look, click the link to the um, Northwest Avalanche Center or our telemetry page. You can see both the wind direction and speed for the prior 24 hours for both um, the weather station at the top of Mount Hood Express and the one uh, at the top of Cascade. The one in the base area does not have an on anemometer on it, so it just has uh, snowfall totals and to the 24 hour total. So. All right, Bob has a question. I'm gonna throw a Greg's way. Outlook on opening date if the current forecast delivers. Well, Dave, we're still gonna hang on to our predicted opening date of the 27th, the day after Thanksgiving. Uh, right now, that's what we're planning on. We're doing that 
to make sure that we have enough terrain to be able to spread people out on. Uh, you know, Mel showed you the mazes with the ghost lanes in between. You know, we need to have enough surface area to be able to do that. So the one thing we don't want to do is rush through this, get people up here and not have our facilities and stuff ready to be able to make that happen. Um, with all these, with our new plans and programs and new building coming online, all this snow bringing, uh, you know, trying to handle this, we want to do it smart. Uh, you know, we want to do it slow. We want to make sure that we have the right product for you. So right now, I don't think we're going to deter from that date. And if the forecast holds the way it is now, you know, we'll start track packing here after this weekend and start hauling snow. And then we'll have a better idea where we're at. Yeah. As I would say, I'm hoping that we can beat that date because that will mean we have so much snow. It won't be like a normal preview. It will be much more of the terrain open, much more room to spread people out. The last thing that we can afford is to stumble getting out of the gate and then have some sort of a reaction or overreaction coming from a government authority saying, you guys don't know how to handle this, we're shutting you down. So it's just not worth it to get some early turns if we don't have enough terrain or space to, to open for our guests. Uh, will the lift lines have a singles lane? They will. And again, if someone wants to ride by themselves, they can use that to say, you know, I, uh, I don't want to ride with anybody else. So we will accommodate not just a singles lane, but also a single situation. I think I got that right, don't I, Mel? Yes, I think so. I mean, it, uh, it's all going to be a learning process for how we're going to handle this. So uh, but yes, we will be allowing people to ride single if they would like to. Um, and if a party of three is willing to have somebody outside their party ride the chair with them, then we would allow that to happen as well. Next question, uh, Mel, probably good for this one too, but what's your plan and communications plan to visitors in the event of a COVID-19 outbreak among your employees? Um, uh, I would see something, you know, both Timberline and Bachelor have done a good job of alerting people on their websites when they've had a uh, positive identification. Uh, but uh, Mel is right now our expert on the notification that's gonna happen you know, in the event that uh, uh, we either have a situation where uh, someone has tested positive or potential exposure and, and quarantine required. Yeah, and if we had that situation, we would be, we would be announcing it. Uh, right now we have a whole response team that's currently five people and we're hiring a COVID response specialist to help us, you know, track our call-ins and anybody that has anything from cold symptoms to, you know, they've, their housemate tested positive to they've got, they, they've tested positive. So um, we haven't had anybody uh, on our team test positive yet. So, but it's been a lot of work just even tracking somebody who's got a sore throat or, and, and when they can come back to work. So we're following CDC guidelines for that. And the Oregon Health Authority guidelines, and it's 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 a pretty it's going to be a monumental effort, but we're dedicated to doing our best to keep our team and and our guests safe. Yeah, um, Brian has a question: Has anyone broached the idea of going back to the eight a.m. start? The answer is only for our Sahali pass holders. <laughs> no, <laughs> on, on the early load that we we may be doing, uh, it, it, it's a challenge. That's for sure. Um, uh, and I I can speak to that further. That's something that years and years ago we did for Mount Hood Express and, and we were never very successful at it. Um, and when we weren't successful, it, it disappointed people and it created more heartache than, than it was worth. And we know that we can be consistent almost, you know, almost 99% of the time getting, getting, you know, Mount Hood, Star, Herm, all that terrain open by 855. And that's, we're sticking with that consistency. Yeah, uh, there's, wait, there, Dave, there's a, just a ton, you know, so our, our Sahali, Sahali Pass holders know there's so much work that goes into opening the mountain every day from all the snowcats up on the hill that need to finish their, their routes and their grooming to our patrollers doing avalanche control work to getting people in and spreading people out. You know, it really stresses the entire system anytime you try to do that. And we love to do that for the Sahali events and do the early load. But on a regular day in, day out basis, we need to work in the, in the light. We go out in the dark to start some of these programs and routes, but we need to be able to see what we're doing to control the train and, and do the right stuff, set up the mountain signs, ropes. There's so much that goes into making it happen that 9 a.m. is the appropriate time and we'll do some special events, but we'll be sticking with that. 
Yeah, when we can't start routes until after seven o'clock in the morning, um, it's nearly impossible. It's impossible to get terrain open on a on an avalanche day by eight o'clock. Greg and Amy and Dean all kind of have the same question about uphill traffic, and uh, Mel's got some good news for you at least, you know, for the time being. For the for the time being, um, so if you're wanting to come up in the next, you know, 24, 48 hours, I think we're going to still allow it, but. Um, it looks like we're going to get a lot of moisture Friday into Saturday and worried about um, avalanche hazard. Our teams potentially will be out doing routes for employee safety. We've got a lot of people up training. We're going to be hauling snow. We're going to be potentially track packing. So we're going to ask probably starting um, Thursday night, depending on the forecast that people, you know, use our, our, our normal routes to exit the ski area so that you can to have your backcountry experience. And that may change uh, once we get through the storm cycle. We may go back to allowing people to, once things calm, the weather system calms, calms down and we can al allow it again before we open. So always check the website and um, for the most current information on the, our uphill travel policy. So, um, Jeremy, there's a question here about what time ski check opens. I thought it, you could answer that, but also maybe um, elaborate a little bit more about the additional racks that we are putting up around the resort and other places that coincides with our, um, our policy now not to allow any equipment indoors or at least from the first floor up on our buildings. Yeah, we're uh, opening gear check, I believe at 745 this season. We'll have an additional gear check location down by the new rental center. Um, we're gonna have more racks out this season than we ever had before to uh, uh, try to allow, make it easy for guests to drop off their skis. We've also had some requests for racks down by the clinic and things like that for folks that are skiing and riding uh, down to their car and eating lunch in their car. So we're gonna try to accommodate that and put some racks there as well. Cool. Uh, there's a question about peer pressure for single bubbles. I'm not sure if that's the peer pressure like everybody wants to be a single or does a single feel peer pressure to feel like they have to ride? Uh, they're not gonna get any pressure from our attendants. You know, if someone wants to, to, to ride by themselves and they feel that if they need to ride by themselves, they will ride by themselves. Or if it's two people in the same household, they're just not comfortable mixing with someone else, you know, we will, we will accommodate. Um, and, uh, um, you know, I think that's a good question about the peer pressure coming from that direction. And Mel, we should probably have that conversation with Cody if we haven't already. Make sure the crowd isn't, you know, bullying people into, you know, four to a four to a chair. That was our whole mantra last year. <laughs> now this year, uh, we will allow people to 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 be able to ride. It might encourage people uh, maybe to go over to a double, you know, so that if they're riding by themselves, there's only one empty seat instead of three. But, you know. It's going to take some patience for for all of us to to figure out how to navigate this. Um, but we're going to try and put four people on a chair. But if people don't want to do that, we're going to accommodate them. Yeah, Lisa, would you would you like to answer uh, Rick's question? I think you probably have the answer. Um. So he has a Sahali oh, pass. Yeah. Yeah. I do have the answer. So a pass is a pass. So if you have a Sahali pass, you can ski with your Sahali pass access. If your spouse has a value pass, your spouse has to ski with their value pass access. So a value pass can't just ski with a Sahali pass anytime. A value pass has to ski during the value pass access times. Mm -hmm. But you could use but, your bonus pass. Yes, and you have could issued... use a bonus pass. Yeah. Yep. Issue the bonus pass for the day to your spouse. They mm -hmm. would get, you know, nine o'clock access. Or if you just want to wait until two o'clock, um, you do that way too. No. Absolutely. Uh, temperature checks indoors. Um, I think we're going to be doing that in some of our operations. Um, uh, Lisa, you'd, you'd, you you know, you're in charge of daycare right now. We don't have daycare for guests this season, right? Right. We do not have daycare for guests. We did get an emergency license and we are supporting our team members with um, a stable group of children in our daycare so that we can use that facility and help support our employees and our team members so that they can work because there is not much daycare available um, for anybody around 
it's very limited. So the company has been supporting our team by allowing us to have an emergency license and operate for the team members during this season. Thank you. Any um, any areas that we are going to uh, require temperature checks, uh, whether it's children's uh, learning center, kids lessons or anything like that? I'm not sure. We temperature check in the daycare every day, every person that comes in there, which is very limited, but I'm not sure what they're doing in other areas. Hey, we, are, we are not temperature checking lessons. We've heard that the temperature checks do not work outdoors and all our lessons are meeting outdoors. So yeah. and the other thing is that, um, and I'm, I'm not, I don't want to give misinformation, so I'll just say it's relatively about half the people who have the virus don't exhibit um, a fever. You know, they, they, they don't have a fever, but they still uh, can be infectious. So our protocol is we just assume everybody has it and we're gonna act that way, you know, whether they have a fever or not. So uh, I think we answered uh, the uh, putting the wind direction on the conditions report. Um, uh, yeah, no, I, think, I mean, I mean, Pete asked it. I mean, it's a valid, we can look at putting it in the conditions report. Uh -huh. If that's something that's important to people overnight, we could add that to our conditions report. <laughs> but you can also look at the telemetry. Yeah. <laughs> so Brian, we're both getting old because I think the last time we had an 8 a.m. load was um, 12, 12 years ago. I think Something so. Like that. Maybe like in that. the, uh, um, I want to say maybe the, uh, it, yeah, it was before 07, 08. So maybe the uh, 05 season. <laughs> uh, Pete says, limited crowds sound nice. Can you limit passes after COVID to control crowds? Um, that, you know, there, there are other ski areas right now that say that they're going into the season requiring or possibly requiring reservations for their pass holders. Um, while we don't want to count anything out, that really isn't our approach for this year. And to a certain extent, we have limited um, our, our passes. Uh, we're not selling any more all access passes. Uh, we're not selling any more new five time or 10 time passes. We're beyond the deadline. Jeremy had some, some good information as far as the percentage of people uh, who have value passes versus those that have all access. I know Jeremy, do you recall those numbers? Uh, yeah, Dave, we went up from about 20% of our folks having value passes last season to about 45% this season. So we're definitely expecting to see uh, more visitation midweek and evenings and less visitation on the peak days. And I think the question may have been about future seasons. Uh, could we do the same? And huh. I think we're likely to see bigger price differences uh, between skiing and riding on the, the peak timeframes and the off-peak timeframes. So you'll see great deals on those off-peak timeframes and folks will have to pay more to come on the peak timeframes. And that's how we're gonna try to smooth out demand between uh, the midweek and the weekend timeframes. Yep, yeah, it, it is a good point. You know, there are a lot of things that we are learning this year that we are going to want to uh, continue to do moving forward. And one of them is, um, you know, we've had dynamic ticket pricing where you could purchase a ticket in, in advance. It was good for a day, but now you are actually um, choosing a start time. So on a peak day, you can, you can uh, start your day at nine o'clock. It's a seven hour ticket or at noon or at two o'clock or at five o'clock. Um, the price gets more affordable, you know, as you get later in the day. And maybe that's going to make people choose a later start time than an earlier start time. So this idea of being able to manage this way is really important this season. But I can see this being a solution for us as we move into future years, and and uh, we we limit um, you know our capacities or or our targets basically for any given day, not based on um, um, how many season passes we have out there how many day tickets we make available, just like we're doing this year. Uh, Brian, you did not miss any early starts. We tried to do one in December and we were not able to do that last year. Um, so then we did one, I think it was in January. And that was that blowdown day that 
we got some people back to shooting star, got a couple of runs in and then had to shut down uh, several lifts. So, um, uh, and then the, the weekend that we announced that we were closing or suspending operations, we had our next one that was queued up and ready to go. So, um, and, and regardless, we're still going to try to do them in the future, even though every time we schedule one, it brings in bad weather like that. But, uh, but there is no bad weather. There's just bad clothing. <laughs> hey, Dave, I was going to chime in. Okay. Uh, we had a couple questions come in about uh, the team. Uh, and some, some folks are uh, sending some appreciation as well for the presentation tonight. Uh, thanks for thanks for doing that. Uh, as I mentioned, we've all earned our our Zoom achievement badge this summer. Uh, we've we've been doing town halls every two weeks for our team all summer because we've really been wanting to make sure we're communicating all of these plans and preparations uh, as far out into the organization as we can. Uh, and so I wanted to say a little bit about there's a couple of questions about you know, non-compliant skiers uh, and having our staff deal with those. We have gone uh, we had a leadership summit in October. We we met with our managers and supervisory teams and went through exactly some scripts, uh, Lisa and, and her teams and uh, Marcos Ramirez, our manager of Department of Public Safety, uh, went through and, and offered that training and we've been doing it down to the department level. Uh, we do have some specific scripting and responses that we are uh, arming our team with to deal with folks who uh, don't wanna comply with the, the protocols that we've put in place to keep everyone uh, healthy and safe. And we also do have our Meadows Code of Conduct uh, on the website, and we are really using that as kind of the bedrock to be able to point to, uh, to be able to, you know, invite someone to, to ski somewhere else or recreate somewhere else if uh, they don't want to be a part of the community and do their part to keep everyone safe. And and that really comes, I know, right from the top. Uh, Matthew Drake has has said that, and so that's I, I wanted to just chime in and let folks know that uh, our our whole team is really taking this seriously, and it's been amazing to watch. Uh, our team come together in terms of making these plans. And it's also part of our rules of use and our operating plan with the Forest Service that we can we can ask somebody to leave and not come back if they're not not willing to comply with the mask wearing protocols. Yeah. And you know, I really have to credit uh, Matthew himself for for setting the tone. And as important as our guests are, you know, and, and we basically um, have uh, uh, three legs to the stool, our foundation, our perpetual stoke at Meadows. And it's always been, uh, you know, our team, our guests, and, and, and then our shareholders. And if you take care of our team and our guests, the rest of it takes care of itself. But Matthew made it very, very clear that our number one priority this year is to keep our team safe. If we don't keep our team safe, we can't operate, you know, and, and uh, uh, thank you, Matthew, for, for your leadership and your guidance and, and setting the direction that, that has taken us from, you know, the, having to suspend operations in March to, you know, getting ready for a, a whole new season and a whole new way of operating this year. Um, well, thanks for that, Dave. You know, um, uh, we have this beautiful new building and these great lifts and this incredible mountain, but we would have nothing. I mean, nothing without our team. So COVID just simply shined a bright light on what we've known for a long time is, is that our team is number one because without our team, we can't serve our guests in, in the way that they expect and they deserve. And so that's why we've taken these measures. Uh, we're going to, we're, we own these measures. We're going to live them. We're going to roll them out. Um, we really hope that the Sahali Gold Pass holders will help us, uh, you know, almost serve as ambassadors and help us achieve this. We have many systems and procedures in place and spent the whole summer uh, shut down, no revenue, um, li living on a PPP loan and a lot of hope and uh, the loyalty and the courage of our team to endure, uh, to come up with all these plans and, uh, and finish this building under tough circumstances. And so you really have no further to look uh, for evidence of the resilience and temerity of our team uh, than what we've achieved here. And so we just ask that our Sahali Gold Pass holders uh, help us uh, do that. And so if you see something that's not quite right or you want to have a, some feedback or whatever, please just uh, find somebody 
on our team or any employee is empowered to take your feedback and and uh, and and do something with it and mm. and move forward with it. So um, it's not about me and and what I've done or whatever. It's it's just about our team and their loyalty and and their courage to hang in there under uh, tough circumstances. And I think that we're ready. Uh, we know there's going to be changes. There's always changes. There's changes in life, that, but, there, but particularly in the ski industry, that's the one thing you can count on for sure <laughs> is change. And, uh, and we're good at it. We're good at it. We're not arrogant. Um, we, we embrace change. We understand it. I think we operate with great humility, but with great resolve. And so I just thank every one of them, uh, every one of our team members for that. Thanks, Matthew. Uh, Richard uh, has a question. Are there changing into ski gear requirements? And we've said this a couple of different times, but boy, we're hoping that people can use their vehicles as their, as their lodge, basically, um, and get changed into gear uh, in their vehicle, in their car. Yes, uh, people still be able to make that change. If you do, you've still got to be wearing a mask. We'd really want you to uh, make your change as quickly as you can, get in and out as quickly as possible. When I first saw that and you said changing in the ski gear uh, requirements, I thought, yeah, we're going to make everybody wear two forties to create the social distancing that we need between people on the slope. So, but, uh, uh, Hey Richard, my, I'm i uh, I'm six feet four and I'd personally like to show you the sunroof shimmy, how to put <laughs> your gear on in the car. <laughs> uh, so maybe use blue chair for single riders. Uh, it's an option for sure. Um, but if we get blue running, it's usually because we're trying to offload some of the other, um, you know, pressure on some of the other lifts. So, um, and uh, we answered this question about um, uh, carrying over or putting the, the pass on hold for Sahali pass holders. Uh, no, it, you, the reassignment is going to be the best option for that as opposed to moving forward. Uh, James, what I am thinking of is how rider to rider expectations on compliance problems might arise. I think that is likely. So you have mostly answered the question, but I remain concerned. Uh, it's a concern of all of ours. Um, you know, we're, we're going to be consistent in our messaging uh, from before the time anybody arrives at Mount Hood Meadows to when they arrive in our parking lot, come through the lodge or up in the lips. You know, I know Mel is working really closely. Uh, with our ski patrol and uh, with our guest hosts and with our with our DPS. In fact, who is presenting our training to our team? It's uh, Marcos, who's in charge of uh, of our um, uh, Department of Public Safety, our manager, because uh, we do need to take it seriously. And and again, we don't want to put any of our guests or any of our team members uh, in a situation that is uh, you know compromising at all. So. Mel, I don't know if you have any more to add to that. No, I think it's well said. I mean, we we are worried about it, um, and we'll be addressing concerns as they come up, and making adjustments, um, and relying on the tools we've put in place. Cool. And, and just to be clear, too, we we have no problem removing somebody from the mountain, and no. trespassing them, and not having them come back. That's a conversation we had with our team to protect them, to protect the guests. We're serious about it. You know, we don't want to allow it to progress. We, you know, Dave said it earlier, we need everybody's help and everybody's cooperation. It's a team effort with guests and our employees. But if somebody is not behaving appropriately or doing those things, we'll remove them. Hmm. Hands down. We'll kick them out. We'll, you know, <laughs> do their pass. We're not going to mess around with that. There's zero tolerance on my end for somebody not complying, you know, with this kind of stuff. And that's the message we've told our team. We want to do it nicely because we're we're friendly. But that's our approach. And we've trained people to do that. But if, it, if that doesn't get the result we want, uh, you know, the next result is removal from the property. Lisa, you might uh, have the answer for Rick. Uh, the next question, I don't know if you can see that in the q and I wasn't sure what the answer to that was. Um, I mean, if they're making a reservation, they are taking a space that we're not selling to someone else. So I'm not sure what that answer is. Jeremy might have a better answer. Uh, the question about if they change their mind on the, the body pass. Um, yeah, I would think if it was ahead of time and we could let someone else, you know, within by four o'clock the day before, then that wouldn't be a problem. But if it was the day of, I wasn't sure what that answer would be. Yeah, we'll have to consider that plan and, and put out some information on that. What 
what we do for our other guests if they uh, make if they purchase a ticket for a specific day and they don't show up. There's a, a five dollar fee to uh, mm -hmm. get it credited as pass holder value and use it for another day. Um, obviously, a bonus ticket pass you haven't paid anything for. So we'll discuss that as a team and come up with yeah. the best plan and yeah. uh, get that information out. Yep, you, you know, some of the other um, ski areas that are requiring pass holders to make their reservations, there's all kinds of systems out there. One that I was reading about today was that uh, you have a seven day window and you can reserve up to seven days. And then it says, you could reserve all seven days, it says, but please only reserve the days you plan on coming. Oh man, what a nightmare, you know, uh, because if I got a pass and I have to make a reservation, I may just make a reservation for every single day and, you know, and if there's no penalty, I'll just keep making a reservation for every single day. So, um, you know, on this one, uh, it's a good question. We'll have to we'll have to mull it over and figure it out and come up with the best way to do that. But uh, I, I think really the answer to that is since you're providing the flexibility until four o'clock the day before to make the reservation, we'll probably be you know not as able to you know do something if that person doesn't show up. Um, you know, if we if we said you have to make that a week in advance and then he didn't show up, we'd probably be more flexible, but um, we're, we're trying to be very, very um, uh, uh, flexible in, in making the reservation in the first place. How will you run blue more this year with a likely longer, slower, or will you run blue more this year with the likely longer, slower lift lines? Um, I answer to that is, is yes, but there's a caveat. And uh, this has to do with the management of our, of our team members and uh, the limited amount of people that we can put on a shuttle to get to Mount Hood Meadows and the staggered arrival times that we're going to have to get our team members to Mount Hood Meadows because we've had to reconfigure the entire team journey at Meadows behind the scenes as well as our guest journey uh, for, for all of our guests. So you know we may uh, not have everybody there at the same time that we've always had everybody there to be able to operate the blue lift when we've, we've done it before. So, uh, but you know, our goal is to keep people spread out um, on those days that it's busy operating another uh, lift will help us keep people spread out. So that'll be one of our tactics when addressing uh, you know, those types of crowds. Um, do you plan to identify Sahali pass holders with a special patch, neck, gaiter, or pin? Something so we can use to identify each other. Let's take it a secret handshake. Uh, hootie hoo. <laughs> hootie hoo. Hootie hoo. <laughs> so then, that's how uh, everybody will know. That, that's interesting. Maybe, maybe, maybe we need to do that. We do have some Sahali hats. I've got some in my office still. So. Anybody want to take the last question? Uh, there was somebody who had, uh, I think, uh, provided a number uh, of um, if someone needed to reassign, they knew someone. So we don't want to create a, you know, a black market out there uh, for this. Um, uh, so I, I don't necessarily know that we have a list of people to reassign to. Um, so I don't have a good answer to that one. Um, uh, consider keeping an uphill travel route as an option for some to lift. Uh, probably not early season, but Mel, I know that John uh, Bain has been looking at a later season, uh, get through February into the spring time frames when there's more consistency, maybe with the conditions and the slopes than what we're going to see through the heart of the winter. And, you know, uh, trying to create maybe some uh, uphill travel lanes. Uh, we don't have anything, yet, um, you know, finalized on that but it is part of the discussion. We, we know that there's a lot of people interested in uh, uphill travel and backcountry this year as, as a way to recreate. So the current plan, you know, the current system that we've had in place for a couple of years is that we have the two routes that kind of go up the perimeter of the ski area. And we ask that you're either exiting the ski area or if you're coming back in the ski area, you're only entering into open terrain. So that's yeah. the current plan right now, but we are definitely looking at some possible options for change. Great. Scott.
Scott, let your uh, Schneevogli uh, Ski Club brothers know that uh, if they have any virtual meetings or anything, we'd be happy to make this presentation to them. Uh, we met with the Northwest Ski Club Council uh, a week ago. We met with uh, the prime timers last night, and uh, we're happy to, to talk through our operational plans and, and get everybody on the same page. You know, what we're telling everyone is the first thing you need to know is to know our plan. Or if you're going to Timberline, no Timberline's plan. Or if you're going to Ski Bowl, no Ski Bowl's plan. You have to know what the ski area plan is, and then you need to be prepared to follow it. In our case, you're a Sahali pass holder. You don't need to make a reservation. You can come up, you know, any day, every day. You know, your pass is good. Uh, and we hope that we can maintain that, not have to have a reservation system for, uh, you know, for um, um, any of our pass holders. And we think we've come up with a really good way of, of being able to manage it. And we're basically limiting the amount of day tickets we're gonna be making available during those peak timeframes. And, and that's because, um, you know, we're trying to support our pass holders best we can, but there's also a reality that, boy, would it be hard to try to run a reserve parking system at Mount Hood Meadows? You know, just just the thought of that. You know, we'd much rather uh, limit the amount of people coming up in advance than to have to um, uh, try to manage and check every single reservation of every single car pulling in. One last caveat to that: we do do know that there will be days that we do peak out. Um, and maybe it's not going to be on uh, a weekend, you know, that we've been anticipating the, the big crowds, but maybe it could be a, 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 an off peak Tuesday, a big powder Tuesday in January. And there'll be days that we will reach capacity based on how many parking spaces we have uh, for, for that day, just as we've always had that situation on certain days. So um, as much as we'd like to say that would never happen, uh, it's always a possibility that it could. So. Um, keep in touch with us and, and uh, early arrival is still good, especially on peak days. Uh, and your pass provides that early access on HERM when we open it at 8.30. So uh, is there a wait list for reassign? I want to be above board. I appreciate that, Alex. Uh, we don't necessarily have a wait list. Uh, I don't know if that's something that, that um, uh, oh, uh, we want to make sure that we're just talking about reassigning for this season, right? Uh, we don't have a wait list for being able to, um, like someone wants to give their Sahali pass to someone else. Uh, we have no new Sahali pass holders. This is it. So Alex, I, I don't have an answer for you there. Uh, we're not necessarily rounding up people that are looking for um, uh, picking up or being reassigned to at this time. Dave, I think I answered him. There isn't a wait list to be able to reassign. You can reassign at any time. So it does take a couple days to process the reassignment, but any time during the season, you can choose to reassign and just fill out that form. Cool. You don't have to wait. Well, much like our, uh, our team town halls, our executive team always waits until the last person uh, question was answered, and uh, um, I haven't been following chat, but it seems like most of everything has been happening on the Q and A, which is awesome. Um, if there's any other questions that we have, we have recorded this, and uh, we will uh, put it on the Sahali page um, uh, and send a link out to everybody. Uh, and then, um, uh, but feel free just to send an email to Sahali at skihood.com or MHM info at skihood.com. So Holly's better because, you know, it addresses your specific concerns. So Alex has a value pass for the 14 year old, didn't get all access in time, waiting for his report card, but missed the window by the day. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> the, sorry about that, but uh, uh, how did the re report card turn out? Good. <laughs> Put my questions in the chat. Will you have some porta potties outside at Herm so we don't have to go inside? Who's got the answer to that one? Yes. Yeah. We will yeah. have, yes. <laughs> have it all set up. We also have another food truck set up down there again this year outside. So you can get some grab and go items and uh, have it all set up for you. So. And Dave, I think a question came in for Jeremy. 
uh, he would answer, can we make reservation, uh, restaurant reservations via the app like we were able to do previously? And I think I saw a question earlier that that was uh, pointed specifically at the ALP. Uh, yes, I believe you'll be able to uh, make a reservation and get a text when your table is ready this year. What app is that, Jeremy? Unfortunately, I don't know the name of it off the top of my head. <laughs> there we go. Fine. We, we finally got stumped. It must be time to wrap it up. <laughs> Thank you, Alex. Uh, appreciate that. Sorry about the, uh, 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 the, uh, the value pass. Um, uh, oh, there's a question about will the lockers be available this year? Yes, we will have lockers. We have new lockers in the Sahali building and we still have the same lockers that we've had in the North Lodge as well. Oh. And if it's a season locker, question. Uh, yes, season lockers are in the same uh, location in the South Lodge. Um, and then uh, hopefully next year, we'll be moving those over to the uh, original uh, change that we had planned uh, in the North Lodge. <laughs> All right, Kathy wants uphill tracks. Oh, cool. Thanks everybody for hanging in. Uh, I guess we had a, what do we, what was the, what was the top count? Was it right? Uh, 125 or so? 115 was the most I saw. And I saw it higher. Well, good. Um, thanks everybody for attending and we appreciate you spreading the word along to, uh, um, you know, your friends, your family, uh, other Sahali pass holders, but maybe more importantly, uh, the skiing and snowboarding community at large. Um, um, the presentation made last last night to the, the prime timers, I get a really good compliment from their president that following the presentation, he said, thank you so much. Um, it looks like you have a strategic plan for handling this season. And uh, that gives me a lot more confidence about, you know, um, uh, what you're doing up there. And, you know, like Matthew said, things can change, but we are good at change and we are also uh, very good at managing risk. Aren't we Mel? <laughs> Aren't we Matt? <laughs> Aren't we everybody? So, um, you know, this is just gonna be one more challenge and uh, we believe we're gonna come through this season. We're gonna do it as well as, uh, as we can, as well as anybody possibly can. And, uh, you know, at some point down the road, maybe uh, this year, maybe next year, Maybe five years from now, we'll be all sitting in that bow wheel bar. We'll host up, a, hoist up our favorite brew, and we'll 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 we'll, we'll do a toast to the the year of COVID and how well we all survived it. So, hey, hey Dave, I, I might just uh, um, close with one final thought here, in that uh, you know I started working at Mountain Meadows in uh, 1968 for my older sister who. Uh, uh, was a tough taskmaster boss. I worked in the shush and she ran the shush and what have you. And um, she had three traits that I think would really serve us well this uh, season. Um, she was uh, patient um, and uh, she was uh, kind and she was persistent. And uh, I think if we act with those three traits this year, um, all of our team and our guests, and we think about all the challenges that we're all going through and we operate with patience and kindness and persistence that we're all gonna get through this and have a great season. So I just would leave you with that, that thought and uh, thank everybody for their participation. Thanks, thank you Scott. Guys for attending. Yep, um, Rick.